Hello, my name is Michael Gert. I have been a professor of piano at Louisiana State University for the past 36 years, and it is my privilege to be a member of the screening jury for the Nashville International Chopin Piano Competition, which will take place in October of 2023. I'm very much looking forward to doing this. In this interview, I've been asked to answer a number of questions, and I will do so as briefly as possible. The first question that I've been asked is what is the single most important thing when performing Chopin? Well, that's quite a question. Um, what's important in playing Chopin is basically what's important in playing any music. Uh, to put it as bluntly as possible, you have to make the right noise at the right time. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm only uh, half joking. You must find the right pacing at each moment in the piece, and you must find the appropriate sound to convey what the music is intended to convey. Now, every judge, every listener, has a sort of hierarchy of importance of various aspects of performance. It's very rare that you will hear a performance where every aspect is really in place and every when that happens, you're hearing a great performance, and great performances, let's be honest, they don't happen very often. And in the absence of a truly great performance, we have to determine what we consider to be the most important thing that we listen for in judging performances. And for me, it's rhythm and pacing. If your rhythm is really good and you're playing at the right tempo, you can get away with an awful lot, in my opinion. You know, you might be able to get away with an ugly sound here and there, you know, a bumped phrase here and there. But uh, you can play with the most beautiful sound in the world, but if the tempo is wrong, it's going to bore everybody. And if your rhythm is soggy, it's, uh, you're changing tempo every couple of bars, it's not going to make an awful lot of sense. So anyway, that's my take on it. The other judges will have different opinions, as I've found out in being a member of juries of other competitions. Um, let's go on to the next question. What Chopin works should one avoid when participating in a competition? Well, again, it very much depends on how you play what you play. But I, in general, I would avoid the very few works by Chopin that are obscure and very infrequently played. Say the rondos of Chopin, or Allegro de Concert, or the Tarantello of his 43. These pieces are infrequently played, and uh, these are among the only works of Chopin that are infrequently played. And they're really not bad pieces, but they aren't quite up to the level of the rest of Chopin. The first sonata, Opus 4, might be another candidate to avoid. Um, if you play obscure works, in a way you're avoiding the issue. When you play in a competition, you're trying to show that you can measure your skill against everybody else's, and uh, there are standards for that. Maybe this is the answer of an old fuddy-duddy, but in some ways I am an old fuddy-duddy, I guess. The next question, what are complete deal breakers for you in one's Chopin interpretation? Well, this is quite a question. I would say if the performer changes tempo twice per measure and can't play two bars in the same tempo, that's a deal breaker. If a performer plays too slowly and drags, that often is a deal breaker. If a performer makes an ugly sound and doesn't voice their chords well, that is sort of a deal breaker as well. There are quite a number of deal breakers. Chopin is one of the most difficult of all composers to play well. You know, we always have to remember that just because a piece of music is popular does not mean that it's easy to play by any means. 
The next question I've been asked is how to choose your 45-minute Chopin recital program. That you should probably include either the second or third sonatas, and that will take care of 20 or 25 minutes of it. And for the rest of it, you should include the contrasting works. You probably should put a virtuoso etude, at least one. And maybe you should do a nocturne to show that you can play lyrically. If you're a brave soul, you might even consider including a group of mazurkas. The mazurkas, in my opinion, are some of Chopin's greatest works, but they are awfully difficult to pull off. If you can pull off a mazurka, you're doing pretty well right there. So in the, in sum, you should uh, choose well-contrasted works to show every aspect of your abilities at the piano. My next question, who are your favorite Chopin pianists? Here's where I can get into trouble because uh, it depends. If you listen to the older, you know, the historical recordings of pianists from the first part of the 20th century, if you listen to them play pieces that last two, three minutes, short pieces, like the waltzes or maybe a nocturne or even a mazurka, they often play these pieces absolutely wonderfully. If you listen to Hoffman and Rachmaninoff, they play these pieces very differently than these pieces are normally played today. And uh, when you listen to them play these short pieces, they have all these personal touches. They don't stick to what's printed in the score. They do what they like. But what they like is so compelling and so interesting and beautiful that uh, one simply has to go along. And if you're talking about the Chopin waltzes, you listen to guys like Courteau and Rachmaninoff and Hoffman. This is really, these are really the best performances of these short, charming pieces. If you listen to Ignaz Friedman play the Chopin mazurkas, you'll never hear them played better. It's absolutely spectacular playing and absolutely impossible to imitate. Now, when we get to the large works of Chopin, the longer pieces, this approach of, you know, uh, momentary inspirations uh, begins to fail a little bit. When you have a piece that's long, it has to be held together. It becomes a little bit tedious to listen to a whole series of pretty moments that seem unrelated. You can do that in a Chopin waltz. It can be charming. You do that in one of the sonatas, you're going to have some problems. You're going to lose your listener. You have to find a way to unify the work. And therefore, modern perform more modern performances of the larger works, which tend to stress the structural integrity of the music, are often a little bit more convincing than you know, the old approach of you know, moment by moment at least uh, to my ears. Now, an exception to this is Rachmaninoff's famous recording of the Chopin B-flat minor sonata, the second sonata, which is really in a class of its own. Uh, Chopin, uh, Rachmaninoff, of course, being a great composer, he knows how to hold things together. He does that when he composes, and he manages to do that with the B-flat minor sonata, despite the fact that no modern pianist would ever even attempt to play it that way. Now, Chopin is probably the most recorded composer ever for, of pianists, and he is undoubtedly the most abused composer as well. You have to be very careful. He's a very difficult composer to play well, but these are some of my favorite Chopin pianists. Uh, the other, I guess I'm Forgot to mention one other thing. If you can get a hold of the B minor sonata uh, recorded by Duno Lipati, that's the best in the business. You, you will not find a better performance anywhere. It's absolutely spectacular. And uh, for that piece, he is certainly my favorite. So anyway, uh, one could talk all day 
about one's favorite Chopin pianist. Every pianist has their own opinion about this, too. Now, uh, on to a question of a different sort. How do you deal with nerves while performing? Well, the first, the best defense against getting nervous is thorough preparation. And uh, the second best defense after thorough preparation is long experience playing your music. When you play a piece for the first time, it's never going to be good. You may as well just face that. You're going to be nervous. The piece will never go as well as it can go. You'll never play it as well as you can play it, or you'll never play it the way you want it to go. It will take you 10 or 15 performances of a piece to even start to play it the way you want it to go. One has to simply accept this, and I think a lot of teachers, especially those who are out of touch with performing, tend to forget when their students have trouble in performance that their students are playing these pieces mostly for the first time. I've heard even great pianists whom I admire very much play a piece for the first time. And uh, I can tell you it's not always great. And so a uh, thorough preparation and the uh, long experience playing the piece are your best defense against nerves and performance. Now, I realize that the second of these, the long experience, is not going to help anybody. It's, it's pretty unhelpful, but it is true nonetheless. You also can deal with nerves by uh, telling yourself and reassuring yourself that you know more about your job than anybody in the audience. For the most part, that is true. And even if it's not true, if you can convince yourself of that temporarily, that might serve as a bit of a defense against a case of nerves. It's sort of a terrible thing to say, but it, you need to develop all the defenses you possibly can. After all, you're getting out there for an hour and demanding that an audience of a couple of hundred people give you their undivided attention for a full hour. Uh, that uh, takes a pretty monstrous ego to begin with. So, I mean, the problem of nerves is definitely a real problem. And every pianist, you know, depending on their physical constitution and their emotional makeup, will deal with these problems in a different way. Next question, what piano advice would you give to yourself if you could go back in time? Well, there's no end to that. When you're young, you always are trying to play faster and louder than everybody else, especially if you go to Juilliard. You go to the fourth floor, the practice room floor. Everybody's trying to play the same pieces faster than the guy next door in the practice room next door. And of course, I, the advice I would give myself now that I've reached a certain age is not to fall for that. It's not about how fast and loud you can play, especially in Chopin. <clears throat> and uh, so not to try to... Uh, play faster and louder than everybody else is one piece of advice I'd give myself. Another piece of advice concerns repertoire. Now, all young pianists like to play lots of Liszt, and they like to play in showier works of Rachmaninoff, and even, you know, the Chopin A2 showy works like that. And uh, if I could go back again, I would give myself the advice to play a little more Beethoven and Schumann and Brahms, a little bit less Liszt than Rachmaninoff. It's all very nice. I was, uh, I was just as guilty as anybody else of relying on Liszt and Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, Petrushka, Prokofiev, Seventh Sonata, all these great show pieces. But th there is more to music than that. Now, you should not neglect Liszt, Hungarian Rhapsodies and show pieces like that. They really help in musical development. But uh, too steady a diet of that can take away from your ability to uh, be sensitive to other things in music. And uh, the advice I would give myself is that I should probably have balanced my repertoire a little bit better, you know, a little bit more toward Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, and maybe a little bit of fewer Hungarian Rhapsodies and the Don Juan fantasies of Liszt. 
Now, the final question I've been asked to address, is there anything else you would like to tell our applicants? I will tell you a couple of things, actually. Having been a judge in international competitions, uh, there will be lots of disagreement among judges, almost no matter what you do. Unless you play, you know, I, I spoke in my you know, earlier in this interview about uh, a great performance, and great performance is happening very infrequently. Now, I judged uh, the Gina Bachauer competition back in 2001, and I heard all these phenomenal pianists from all over the world. And my impression most of the time was that each one of them was trying to play faster and louder than the others. Now, who am I to talk? When I was young I, and competing in these competitions, I did exactly the same thing. But uh, there was one performance given by one person in this competition that really was a great performance. Everything was there, and in fact, the judges all agreed that this performance was great, and it was the best performance in the competition. When you have a great performance, which, as I say, doesn't happen very frequently, then there's very little to disagree about with the judges, and we generally agree. We don't choose the wrong winners in competition because we're incompetent. As I used to think as a kid, I used to think, oh, the judges are incompetent. They always choose the wrong person. It's not true. What is true is that every judge has, as I said before, a hierarchy of importance of the various aspects of a performance. And <clears throat> they disagree on what is most important in a performance, what faults are less important. And because of this disagreement and that this uh, potential for disagreement, my advice to a competition applicant is to try to play rather middle of the road. Not because I think that's the way one should play, but because you will offend the fewest number of people and therefore you're likely to get further in the competition. It's unfortunately a terrible thing to say. Bella Bartok made a very good comment. He said competitions are for horses, not musicians. There is a certain amount of truth to that, but here I am judging this competition. And this reminds me of something another famous pianist once said. I'm not going to say who. And uh, he, in general, did not like competitions, but he would reluctantly judge them. And he said, well, if I'm going to play God, at least I can play God the way I feel God should be played. And that's about all I can tell you. Um, it does not hurt to be technically very well prepared. It doesn't hurt to play with a beautiful sound. It doesn't hurt to play the music at the right speed and to play with good rhythm and to watch your phrasing and all the wonderful things that we all work on all our lives. But uh, added to that, we also uh, have to have a little bit of luck as well. And that is about all I can tell you about advice to competition applicants. If you do enough of them, you'll probably win something somewhere. Many famous pianists who've won big competitions have probably lost a lot more of them than they've won. They just don't tell you about it. Anyway, uh, I wish everybody in this competition the very best of luck, and I can't wait to hear you. Thank you very much.